Let's go live with Jack Kelly. Welcome to the one of a kind LinkedIn live show that will help you with your job search and advancing your career. We will bring in educated career experts who will share their insights and give you inside tips on how to be successful in your job search. Now let's get into today's show with your host, Jack Kelly. Okay, Mark Levine. Welcome. Welcome to Jack Kelly. Let's go live with Jack Kelly. We are live. We are on. And uh, hey, thank you so much for joining. And I'll open up to you. Uh, you have a great background in recruiting, in HR, in business. So maybe you could talk a little bit about who you are and what you do, and we could just jump into helping people. Okay, Jack. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We're going to help a lot of people today, I hope. Uh, kind of circumnavigate themselves around the world of job seeking. And uh, my background is, as you can see, just by looking at me, I've been around the workforce a long time. And, Maybe uh, like five years, six years, right? <laughs> yeah, I wish. But then again, I wouldn't have all this wisdom. So uh, I've been around a number of years uh, starting out in uh, the recruiting agencies of New York City, which is a great proving battleground for, for most people in the field because you're seeing a lot of people coming in off the street and looking for jobs. And you certainly have to figure out which ones you want to move on and which ones you want to pass on. So you get a good experience uh, with dealing with some of the major companies in the New York City area and uh, the candidates that come your way. So that's kind of where I found my main love for what I do. And that little job, which for me was $95 a week versus commission, uh, wow. the best college investment I ever made in myself because it gave me a sense of what I wanted to do and it taught me how to do it. And it gave me, I think, when you work in New York in any job, it gave me a lot of speed in getting things done. You got to move fast. And uh, from there, because my degree was in industrial psychology at Syracuse University, I, I did want to get into what was then called personnel, uh, later on became human resources. I got to see that evolution and uh, decided that uh, that's what I wanted to do. But uh, it was difficult back in those days because it was still personnel, which was a basically a paper pushing career. It, it didn't have all the nuances and all the sophistication that human resources has today. So, back then, Mark. Yes. Did, did the companies pay commissions for recruiters or did candidates pay? That's a very good point. In those days, I think I was at the tail end of when a lot of agencies were asking candidates to pay. So uh, I remember a company called uh, Dunham, which I don't think is around anymore. I'd actually gone to them and uh, I had to sign paperwork for uh, being responsible for the fee if I got a job. I don't know if any- I ask, it's that. interesting because the reason I ask when I started at Taft Associates, right. I, don't, I don't know if you've ever uh, you know, dealt with them or know them back in the day, Peter Gay, who is the founder, I remember him telling me, hey, this is how it worked up until, you know, I guess I started as probably mid-90s. So before then, you're saying, hey, this is, you know, it's, it worked the complete opposite way. And uh, which, is, which is surprising because now, I don't know if you've noticed this, I've definitely heard of recruiters asking for fees from candidates, which is a little sus. I'm not, I don't want to disparage anybody, but I don't know. It's a little... My advice to most people, if that ever comes their way, run, run away, run fast. Yeah. Because we're on the employer side. I'm on the employer side and I don't have any recruiters calling me, letting me know that the candidates are going to pay the fee. Yeah. And these are major reputable agencies that we've all heard of. So if anybody's asking for a fee, I, you know, it's starting to sound like a scam to me, unless it's a nationwide organization, check Better Business Bureau, go online. Don't pay anything, folks, unless you know that it's legitimate. You just got to think in markets like this, where you have millions of people who are out of work, who are underemployed, who you know maybe kind of were thrust into the gig economy, want to get back to a traditional job. Yeah. You get people who probably you know could take want to take advantage. You know, folks. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I always worry about that with job seekers because you're very vulnerable when you're a job seeker. Yeah. We've all been in that position. And there are a lot of services, like even on, on my jobs and career advice forum in Facebook, I get a lot of requests to post things. And I'm not thrilled posting things that cost people money. You know, the reason I set that board up, it's the reason you and I met, uh, is to help people. Um, yeah, there have been times where I found people that I can hire myself, but 
that's not a bad thing. But <laughs> with come-ons uh, for, you know, career consulting or any kind of uh, placement help or training, you got to be very careful today. Uh, you're dealing with people you know nothing about. It's very easy to throw up a web page and make it look like it's a established business, but, you know, then you're looking down at what you've given up to someone who really set, set themselves up to take it from you. So I recommend all job seekers, anything having to do with you paying money, seriously investigate those services, make sure they're legitimate, you know, make sure that they're in a, they, they give you a URL, they have uh, information there that shows that they're established, maybe connected with a better business bureau, uh, that there are no scams when you Google them, good reviews. These are, these are the kinds of litmus tests that you want to take. You know, I don't want to jump around too much, but you mentioned about the Facebook page. Maybe you could share it with sure. everybody so they might want to uh, join it. Okay. And, and, and then also, if you don't mind, after you share it, maybe you can tell a little about like what you see on there, like what questions these people have, what are the issues they're dealing with? Um, because that can relate to a lot of questions people have here as well. Yeah, the uh, Facebook page came about in the spring of 2017. Uh, just something that I wanted to do because I was starting to say, you know, one time or another in our lives, we're all in a position where we're looking for a job. You know, some people look at a human resources person or a recruiter saying, you have no idea what I'm going through, but even recruiters and HR people have been looking for jobs and sometimes for a long time. Uh, I've had periods of unemployment uh, that kind of set me in the mode to say, hey, look, when I can help somebody out, even while I'm employed uh, as a recruiter in HR, I I'm more than happy to pass a, a hand along to a candidate I have that maybe you don't want to say that or do that or help them out for the next time. So I decided to set up the page and it was slow going. You know, I think, again, kind of like what I was talking about, giving money away to strangers, people that want to really reveal themselves or open themselves up on a, a Facebook page run by somebody they never knew or heard of. Um, and it stayed that way for a while. I had to populate it with content. And I think as soon as people saw that there were no come ons. I wasn't looking for anything. I wasn't allowing anything on the page to set anybody up for any kind of a financial disaster. They started the post and they started the post genuinely. You know, a few people inside posted me asking me, is it okay to post something to an open board? What if my boss sees it or someone else? I said, I'm, I'm not gonna close the board down because I want other people to learn from these situations. You know, what good it would be if you want to talk to me side by one-on-one, -on -one, that's fine. We can speak on the phone or we can text. But I really do want people to have an opportunity to learn from different situations and also help you as a candidate by providing their own input. And sure enough, people started posting more and more uh, almost personal situations uh, about their job search, about their career search about even things that are happening on their jobs, struggles that they're having with their bosses or with their companies. And the outpouring, you know, we talk about what happened in Washington yesterday and everybody really being concerned about people not caring about other people. The caring that's come out of that page has been just unbelievable. You know, sometimes we'll get 25 or 30 good natured responses to people uh, who are having a problem, people sharing their advice or sharing a resource or something along those lines that those other people find helpful. A lot of the posts we see, people just seem to be very scared and alone and, you know, they're going through a tough time in their life and they're, they just don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. I think by the time we get done with them, when all of the other members, we have 10,000 members in the group, after they've input, I, I can almost feel that they feel a little bit better. They feel they're not so alone and they take away something that they can at least try. Uh, a bunch of different pieces of advice. It's all good. It's all good. It's interesting. So when they say they feel like alone and feel isolated, are they people who are in between jobs or actually people who may have jobs but also just feel kind of stuck? I think what we see most are people that never really found their niche. Mm -hmm. They're getting a little older and they're getting a little bit more afraid that they'll never find it or that if they do, they're going to have to give up something or they may not be accepted by an employer. You know, there was one on there a couple of weeks ago, you know, I've been searching for a career. I'm 51 years old. And 
I could see where that would be a little scary. You know, we hear yeah. about employment discrimination for age, you know, and they're thinking, gee, now I'm going to go learn something new and that's going to take time. You know, I may not get to the next job until I'm 53 or 54. And what do I do in the meantime? How do I make a living? So they're dealing with that too. Do I stay on the job? Do I leave? Do I study full time? Do I study part? Well, what do you say? Like, well, that's a that's a really see that's a big issue, and I, I see that both both professionally and personally too. Dealing with what what kind of advice do you and the people in the group give to folks like that? Well, we're I, in the age individual, of, you know. We're in the age of participation awards, so I guess I come from a different generation. Remember right. that ninety-five dollar draw versus commission job I had. Well, that was Monday through Friday, hopping on a bus from New Jersey to New York City and then reversing that at night. Well, guess what? On the weekends, I ran flea markets, uh, English Town Flea Market in New Jersey. I would sure. get materials and whatever I could find to sell. Uh, my wife's uncle manufactured uh, Jeffrey B. Neckwear, and he used to give me the IRs, and I would sell them. And I'd stand out in the bitter cold or in a high heat. And quite frankly, I made a lot more doing that than I did in the job in New York. <laughs> Well, a lot of people don't see that as an option that, you know what, to get where you want to go, you, you got to put in a little extra elbow grease. You can't have it both ways. You know, work family balance is important. We hear a lot about it, but if you got to work a second or third job or do something else on the side, you got to do that. And, and sometimes it's a good thing to do because now you have a little bit of income coming in extra, taking the pressure off you. You can study something, you can get a certification or a degree keep the job that you have full time, you know, you may have to stay up a little later at night going online and doing the homework or whatever, but you know, any, ask anybody who's ever started a business, if it's been easy restaurants, you know, after you go home, you're done dining. They've got to clean up the place. They got to check their inventory. They, they got to lay out what orders they need. Uh, if you want to get somewhere in your life, you, you got to put in that extra effort. And if that means, you know, working a second or third job and giving up an evening or a weekend, well, that's just the way it's got to be. So I think we get a little bit of that advice and then a whole bunch of other stuff too about looking for careers where maybe the barrier to entry is a little lower. Uh, remembering though, that if you accept a job where the barrier to entry is lower than where you are now, you're going to have to give up income. I mean, there's no question about that. And that's a big issue for some people there on some job that doesn't have transferable skills. They're making, you know, $30 an hour or whatever. And, they come to a new job, they don't have a lot of experience. That may get cut down to $15 an hour. But the question is, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint. So if you're able to do that and supplement your income some other way, at the end of the day, you're gonna be looking back and you've successfully transitioned and you're in a good position to make even more money than you were making before. So I, I wish people would look at it that way. And these are some of the kinds of advice we get from other people on there. People that have been- so what you're saying, a couple of things, and it's really interesting. So one part is kind of like old school advice in that, hey, if you're in that example, you mentioned someone who's 51, but for all intents and purposes, that could be 31, 41, there it is. where you feel like, all right, what do I do now? Either I'm in between jobs, I'm worried about losing my job. Um, I hate my job. I got to do something else. I hate my career. So it's one of those things where you have to say, hey, you got to do what you got to do. If that means taking some sort of contracting role in that space that you want to go to, right. pivoting a little bit there, swallowing your pride a little bit, taking way less money to kind of learn it. So it's really, you, it's, it's, it almost sounds like you got to take control of your own life, of your own career. Absolutely. You Absolutely. A hit to the ego, you, gotta, you, you just got to do it. And you gotta you gotta look out for yourself because really the way no one else is gonna do it for you, right? So you gotta figure it out and figure out, hey, this whatever I gotta do, I gotta do. Yeah. Put in the time and the effort. I mean, if you watch Shark Tank, that's a great way of learning a bit about this. The sharks will ask whoever's up in front of them, how much of your own money did you put into this thing? And sometimes they're amazed by how much. You know, some people will say we took my entire savings. Same kind of thought. You're investing in something. Now you're investing in yourself. So if you have to work a little harder, you have to work a little longer, you have to take a little less pay if you see the light at the end of the tunnel. And not all this is while you're in the tunnel, before you go in the tunnel, do a little research on the career field, see how many job openings are projected, see what the dollars are. 
it's worth making that sacrifice. So you don't go out to eat two nights a weekend. You go out to eat one night a weekend. You know, maybe you don't take a long vacation on a cruise. You know, you take your family to the neighboring state to, a, you know, a recreation park or, or into a small city. Uh, you got to do a little, a little bit of sacrifice. So the people that get on the, on the board and they post, the people that feel so threatened, uh, I don't know that they've really considered that. I, I think they really have to take a look at it and say, this is not going to be easy. I, I have to give up something. But if I make the right choice this time, then I'm going to be yeah. looking at a better situation down the road. I don't know how you feel about this, but to me, it seems that the period we're in now and where we're going is going to be just constant change. So yeah. that even if you decide, all right, hey, I want to pivot, I want to reinvent myself, I want to do something different, six months from now, a year from now, two years, you might have to do it again. And then two, three years again. It just, I don't know about you, it just feels that way. It feels like this was happening, but then the pandemic really accelerated that trend where, I mean, look at the restaurant industry, as you pointed out, look at the hospitality, look at yeah. the lines. You would have thought, okay, what could go wrong? I'm working at Disney. How could anything go wrong? And then if you're in the park division, you're, you're, you're crushed, What you know? And then if you're down in Orlando and everything is, all the entertainment is gone because of social distancing, you got to completely do something different. And then it's, it's right? it seems like a, it's, a, it's like we're in a different age now. Am I wrong? What do you think? You know, life doesn't travel down a smooth road. You know, there are lots of curves and bends and you have to be able to adapt and you can't fall apart when something changes on you. I mean, one day I woke up and I got a cancer diagnosis esophageal cancer, home by myself. My wife was at work. I go online to see how bad is this one? Wait, this is you? This is, this is me. This is me. This is me back in 2004, the fall. Wow. I had just started my own business, a recruiting company that I started uh, July of uh, 2003, uh, just starting to do nicely. And a little bit of discomfort in my stomach and went to the gastro doctor. And I'd always have, I always used to say that my stomach could write its own autobiography because I've always had digestive issues. Just uh, again, you, you don't get to pick and choose what comes to you in life. And uh, he decided to do uh, a, uh, the, uh, uh, what's the, uh, not, not the colonoscopy, but the, um, whatever. I mean, whatever it is. You yeah, yeah, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just eluding me right now. But anyway, uh, didn't expect to hear anything negative. He came out and said, I've found the beginnings of a small tumor. Now, with this particular cancer, esophageal, most people find it too late. You're already having a hard time swallowing. And by then, the tumor is big. It's metastasized. So we found mine on a fluke. And uh, I had to put my business on hold. I mean, I, I went through hell of chemo, uh, New York Presbyterian. I went through uh, the uh, pull-up surgery. And I was in the hospital five and a half weeks with all sorts of medical complications, blood clots in my lungs. And... Um, I had a, a, a stomach leak uh, where uh, I couldn't drink or eat anything. I was on a feeding tube for almost 10 weeks. Uh, life hits you hard, but you know what? Uh, I worked my business back up, sitting in my chair, literally with my feeding tube, my feeding bag hanging, and my IV pole alongside me. Because you I, had, I, mean, like, we were I to had no option. I, yeah, of course, I could talk, sure. I mean, there was nothing, you know, during the surgery. Yeah. I, I was intubated, but, uh, you know, certainly when I got home, I was, I was, well, in the hospital, I was fine. I was able to talk. They used to call me the mayor when I was there because I had such an upbeat look on things. So they took me from room to room to talk to the other patients. You know, you can't look at life as something that's going to run smoothly all the time. You got to be able to just go with what it is. Uh, you know, I'm glad now I can look back at 16 years ago and yeah, I have different plumbing. I have different issues that go along with it, but, uh, Hey, I'm here now. Uh, I'm happy. A little bit of survivor's guilt. And maybe that's one of the reasons I had the job board too. Because look, other people- Why passed. would you have survivor's guilt though? That's- It's very common that- really? why, why did I get to live and the nice guy in the next bed didn't make it? I stayed, wow. in I stayed in touch with a lot of people that I was in the hospital with. And one fellow had a really great job with AI insurance. Um, he, uh, he was the- I think the international sales manager. And uh, he was fine when he got out of the hospital. I stayed in touch with him. And all of a sudden, one day he was playing golf, had a pain in his lower back. Well, guess what? The cancer returned. That was like June. By November, he was gone. 
So you, you tend to feel like, why I'm happy, but why yeah. me? Why, why did, why was I saved? So that you want to do nice things for people after that. You want to, you want to do things that show that, okay, you were saved and it wasn't a waste that you actually went out and helped people. And, and that's really, that's really the whole basis of why we're talking today. That's why the board exists. That's why I do it. I went in 2005. I mean, this was surgery in March. I was asked by the mayor of our town from the other party to come back to council. And I, I agreed because I was a councilman for about 10 years prior to that because I wanted to, to do good things for the people in my town. And, um, you know, he crossed party lines to bring me back because he knew I was that kind of a guy. So I'm a, I'm a guy that looks to help people. And my job board, uh, I work very hard on it. And I try to protect people from the people that are looking to profit from them. And I, I just love to hear the success stories of the people that get work uh, as a result of uh, what they either learn or find on our board. Sounds like that whole situation changed your life, changed your mindset. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. I'll never go back. Not that I was very much different, to be honest, but I do put things in different perspective. You know, I know that you live for the day now, you know, every day is a gift uh, that you don't waste your time on things that you don't want to. If I watch a movie and I don't like it by half of the movie, I shut it off. If I read a book that I'm not thrilled with half of the book, I close it. Uh, if I'm doing something that I feel is, doesn't have any benefit to me or to others, I drop it and go find something else to do. You know, I became a Mason, a Freemason after the surgery. So I wanted to learn how men better themselves. So I've, I've really invested a lot in myself so that I can do more for myself and helping others. So yes, it has inspired me. Absolutely. Amazing. It's me. You know, I've seen this and, and noticed this with people that let's say on the recruiting side where, Hey, I I'll make this example up, you know, Hey, I was a tax accountant for, you know, 15 years. And mm -hmm. you know, I know someone who had coronavirus or maybe someone passed away from coronavirus who I love. And they said like, is, is this what I want to do for the next five years? Is this what I want to do for the next 10 years, 20 years? What else? You know, they got to be something more. They got to be some, you know, a better way of doing it. And I hear that so often now where people start reevaluating, like, what am I doing? Like, am I just wasting my life doing X? And then I also find out, Mark, I wonder if you see this too, people who are making nice livings, they get caught because like, I'm doing really well. And they feel a little guilty saying, all right, I want to kind of do something else because people look and go, wait, you're doing how much are you making? And you're just want to do something different. You're crazy. But they don't realize like, to your point, life is fleeting and it's short. And if you're not happy, well, what good is it? Hey, my kids were five years old three minutes ago and now I'm 64. Yeah. It does go by fast. My parents warned me about that raising kids and said, look, don't miss a moment because it goes fast. The little league games, all that stuff. And the whole life goes fast. And I think you need to, to do things that, that are rewarding. I mean, I think you're almost in prison if you're in a job or a career that you no longer like. And sometimes you're, you have to be, you're trapped. You have, yeah. a certain li you have a lifestyle. But that's why I say, if you could do something on the side, if you could find other ways to um, enhance your earnings or find side ways of developing a new skill or whatever, so you can kind of offload yourself to the next career. I've got a friend, I think he worked for uh, one of the big insurance companies in New York a number of years ago. And on the weekend, he was a photographer, did weddings, bar mitzvahs, whatever. I'd say maybe within five years after he started doing that, he, he left his job in New York City and he did that full time. He's now about 75 and he still does it, lives in a beautiful house, has a beautiful car, and he's living his dream, you know. He does not only that type of photography, he does the photography that he enjoys, whether it's, I don't know, nature or whatever. Yeah, you know, life is too short not to, it's not just passion, but it's passion and purpose. You have to put the both of them together. Uh, and you know what? There are people that have never, dis this is what's scary. There are people that have never discovered their niche, their career. And as a result of that, they've really, deprive the world of possibly something very good 
Uh, I even say that in recruiting. I always, and that's why I love recruiting. I love finding people. That's my regular job, by the way, folks. I love finding people that come to the company. We hire them. I watch them grow. They really contribute. And my little thing that I always say to people is, you know what? You know what recruiting is? There's a guy right now standing in an Iowa cornfield that if only I could find him or her uh, and hire that person, that person may make the difference between a company that's mediocre and a company that's doing a lot better. It's a challenge of finding good people and developing people in the same way it's a challenge of finding a good job and a good career. And I've had enough jobs over the years that, you know, I give very, very poor ratings to. And, and my current job at, at Thermo Systems, I tell my wife that I died and went to heaven. This is the best company I've ever been associated with. These people are just wonderful. I've worked for some very, very difficult bosses. And I think everybody here really appreciates all of the wonderful things that, that we do uh, for the team. Uh, in fact, they are the sponsors of my jobs and uh, career advice uh, job board. You say, what are they sponsoring? They're sponsoring my time. They say, Mark, you could do this during the day. This is not a side thing. You know, you're, you're building our recognition, but you're also helping a lot of people. And, and that's what I like about the company I work for. They, they truly do want to set an example as an employer, a good neighbor. And, uh, you know, that's why I say that people really have to find what it is they love and do it because you don't have a lot of time on this earth. So, so there's a lot to pack and you just really, yeah. so, so much great, great advice and wisdom. And one of the things that really resonates with me and I'm sure with a lot of people too, mm -hmm. is to find something that you have a passion for that gives you purpose. Yes. You know, gets you out of bed in the morning when you don't want to. But then how do you, how do you balance that Mark where if let's say you have somebody who got out of school, has $200,000 in debt, you know, maybe they chose a major that seemed cool at the time and interesting, yeah. but doesn't really pay the bill. Like, how did that, it's hard. Like, so your passion, if your passion purpose doesn't really pay the bills and can't pay off your tuition, what do you do? Well, that's a complication, I think, yeah. unfortunately, that my generation didn't have to deal with very much. You know, we had parents that paid the whole thing. Uh, I went to Syracuse University, which now I think is like $63,000 a year. When I went, it was probably closer to like six. Uh, what a parents, difference, right? It's it, yeah, such, same education. <laughs> same. So different. I don't even bet you, I bet you it was, it was, I bet you it was a better education back then because then, it, you know, it would focus more on like core stuff as opposed to questionable kind of classes that like, what are you really learning? I'd have to agree with that. I, I think you're probably right. I mean, I can't compare because I'm not there now, but you know, I do realize it's a major burden on these these young people that they have to come out with such debt. You know, I always pray that our government is going to provide them with some sort of relief. I I think they need to to help the economy because it takes years and years to climb out of this debt, and it slows down them from having a family and buying a home and all the things that I got to enjoy a little earlier. I I was married at what 23. And, uh, you know, I had a- oh, It's so different now, right? It's much different. It's much different. It's very yeah. rare to have that now, right? Now you get married at 27. You know, people say your Keep career- going. You reach Keep your going. career. You reach your career peak at about 40. Yeah. You know, by the time you're 45, you think companies are starting not to look at you, but look at other people. You haven't had a chance to get yourself going. So I, I do feel for them. But again, I think the advice is the same. You know, smart people, find ways around things. So, you know, if you have that debt, you have to cut back on whatever it is you may be spending. You have to find other ways of picking up an income, you know, working long or doing other things. Uh, you know, maybe speak to people where you can maybe uh, lower the, the debt through, you know, loans with a lower interest rate. I mean, I'm not a financial exec uh, expert, but I mean, any problem that you face, there is always a solution. You just have to be willing to go look for it. You know, and we have a job board because we want other people to give advice based on their own experiences. I think the same goes here. If somebody with a post today on the board, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not loving what I'm doing. I owe $200,000 a year. I'm really stressed. What do I do? Uh, you're going to get all sorts of uh, responses all over the board. And uh, then you take them and you, you throw out the extremes and, and certainly the things that you tried that didn't work or you don't like. And, and you kind of find a path there's always a pathway and, and you follow that path. I mean, 
again, it's not a smooth road. I mean, we're going to struggle here and there throughout our 70, 80 years that we get, maybe more in certain cases. My mother's 97. But uh, good luck to me. But uh, the, the bottom line is uh, you, you got to be flexible. You got to be able to roll with the punches. And, and that's what they've got to do because we can't make that debt disappear. It's happened. It's there, you know, unless the government decides they want to take it away. But in the meantime, you still got to live life and you still have to do the things that you want to do. You want to raise a family and own a home. Uh, it's up to you to, to use your, your noodle and, and try to figure out what ways you can, you can grow. That's, there's no other better answer than that. The, that that's the, the answer is here. See, that's what it, it seems like it keeps going back to what you're doing. It's really taking active control over your career, over your life, and yes. understanding that you're going to get curveballs thrown at you. You're going to get harder. You're going to get you know, health issues. You're going to get everything. Yeah. Still have to keep going, have to keep pushing, have to keep trying. You know, Sometimes you luck out, and you, you, you've probably seen this as much as I did in recruiting. Sometimes you have a person who's in the right place at the right time and it just clicks. Other times you can have someone who's fantastic. They're just great at what they do, brilliant, best schools, best grades, but just you know, can't, it just doesn't click. Maybe it does down the road, but it just takes a while. And sometimes it's just, you don't know. It's just kind of crazy luck. That have, you, have you ever read Mindset by Dr. Carol Dweck, which talks about the uh, two major mindsets? There's yeah. A, a closed mindset and the growth mindset. You just described that, you know, the closed mindset is people have been telling you all your life, how wonderful you are and how many things that you can do, right. You went to the best schools, you got the best grades. You've got everything by a very young age that you're ever going to need. And you just stop right there versus the growth mindset, which basically tells you to keep looking around and seeing what you can learn and making yourself better. Uh, I, I think that's what plays into this. I mean, keep looking around, keep finding ways to get to where you want to be. Uh, no guarantee that you're going to be a millionaire, no guarantee you're going to have the best job in the world, but you know what, y you know, we end up getting what we need, not always what we want, but you got to go get it. You, you can't wait for it to come to you. And I think that's a problem today. I think a lot yeah, of people think you, Mark. fall Can in their laps. See, see Mark, this is what, uh, not to go off road here. Okay. But what I think happened is this, particularly for the millennials and Gen Z's and to a certain degree, to Gen X's like myself, mm -hmm. uh, it was like, okay, if you go to school, you work hard, you know, you check off all these boxes, you could have that white picket fence and that nice suburb or what have you. But for a lot of people that didn't happen and then yeah. didn't happen, they're like, what, what's going on? You know, I was told I would have a really cool job and live a great life and travel and all that, but it's not happening. And I think that just in my opinion, I think that's why you get a lot of people who are just angry all the time. Let's, let's be honest. How, like you go out through your day, how many people, I think you run into more angry, ticked off, frustrated, surly people than you do, you know, nice people lately. And then think about it. Like all of a sudden you have things like Antifa, you have, you know, a move towards socialism. You have what happened last, you know, the other, just the other day. Yeah. And you see, it just shows like people are like, angry and frustrated because the way I look at market, people are happy and they're doing well and they have a great job. You're not going to go doing crazy stuff. You have a great job. <laughs> you got to, you know, you, you know, you're going to go, you want to go to work and do better and make even more money and, and have more fun. Well, you remember the participation awards that I brought up? Yeah. That wasn't around in my time. Uh, I laughed when my little son was in little league and he was on a championship team. They didn't lose a game, but then again, my son never hit a ball and he never <laughs> caught one either. And he got one. He's got the awards. They're in the garage. You know, yeah. I don't think he I don't think he feels like he earned anything other than yeah. he he was lucky he was put on the right team. And that turns into entitlement. And entitlement is that, well, gee, you know, I I've got an award. Uh, I'm not going to tell people I don't have to tell people how I got it, that I didn't hit the ball, but I was on the championship team. And then mom and dad, of course, love us. And they always say that we're the best looking and the best smartest people. And maybe we're not. And then you turn into a nihilist or a. Uh, in certain cases, um, you know, somebody that uh, really is a narcissist and, uh, and just really wants to roll over, over people and really has no caring. You know, you're in my way. Uh, you know, Charles Dickens, you know, let's get rid of the surplus population. And, and I think that's where we're at today. And, uh, you know, that's why my board, the job board is, is so 
refreshing that people are willing to step out of themselves and share something with somebody else. If we all did that, if, if we all dedicated ourselves to doing one single nice thing a day for somebody else, we would turn right. this whole country around. But right now we run, that we run to our own corners right now and say, gee, what, 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 what did I get today? Yeah. You know, those other people, that's competition. They're in my way. And it's, it's been that way for, you know, you know what it, this really happened? I was in the, the, the work field and I, I know exactly when this happened. The early 1990s, we had the new social contract. You remember that? No, I can't remember what. Well, my father worked for Macy's Corporation for 36 mm -hmm. years. The new social contract came, uh, there was a major recession. Mm -hmm. Actually, there were a few, uh, 1981 and 1982 when Reagan got in. And then there was another big one in the early 90s. And companies started laying off for the very first time. And then they said, you know what? We're going to do other things for our employees. We're going to do more training. We're going to give more benefits. We're going to give you marketability as a candidate or as an employee, but we can no longer promise you stability. And I think people started to realize they looked at their parents and then they looked at their own situation. Sometimes it was their parents. You know, Think of a little kid. The father comes home and says, I got let go from a job. The kid immediately thinks in school, is that the same thing as getting sent home by the principal? It must yeah. be. Yeah. So, dad, what did you do wrong? Son, I didn't do anything wrong. Well, then why are we not able to pay for the things that we need? Why were you punished? So that kid grew up with a mindset of, you know what? I'm going to burn them before they burn me. I'm going to become an employee mercenary. I'm going to jump jobs every two years. I'm going to get out of the company I'm at to get the best offer I can get. I'm going to jump for a dollar an hour more because I'm not gonna wait around to have what happened to my dad or what's happened to me earlier in my career. And I think that became a mindset for everybody about do, do to others before they do to you rather than do unto others uh, to try to stay one, one jump ahead. you know. And, and that all led to more like, well, okay, now I got this job, I'm making some nice money. Guess what? I'm buying a McMansion house somewhere in New Jersey and I'm going to add three more trees that my neighbor has next door. And I'm going to buy a Lexus as opposed to his uh, Chevy. And uh, all of a sudden it became about us, you know, all from, I think that new social contract, because people never felt like I'm satisfied. I'm happy. I, like my father did. I had a great job. They pay me nicely. Maybe I can make more elsewhere, but I'm here. I like the people I work with. Now you couldn't do that anymore because to be up with the Joneses, you had to constantly challenge yourself and you had to hate your employer because yeah. you figured somewhere down the line, they're going to lay off. They're going to let me go. I can't wait for that to happen. So I think, I think that all led to where we are today or a big piece of it anyway. I agree with you. It's fine. And, and you hit it from all sides because think about it. You have people like Jeff Bezos worth yeah. $200 billion dollars. Amazon is open, taking a, making a fortune during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And then you have people in his warehouses making, you know, virtually nothing. You have small businesses that were closed down, not able to stay open. And you're, it just, it's across the board, you know? So it kind of alienates people and disassociates them with, yeah, why am I going to kill myself for this company? And I could get fired tomorrow. Because how many, how many companies have you seen over, over the pandemic? Where, and I wrote about this extensively. There's yeah. so many where, okay, we're going bankrupt, but the CEOs, executives are going to take million dollar bonuses and 10, 20,000 people say, goodbye, take care. We put him out in the worst job market in modern history. Right. And it's, it's, it's kind of unconscionable. But then for people who see either go through that, have family go through that, or just read about it, they're like, to your point, I'm not going to have. I'm not going to trust my employer. I'm not going to trust my boss because they did it. You know, everyone's doing it. So why are they not going to do it to me? Exactly. It creates a really bad situation across the board. Yeah. And the business will tell you that we have other mouths to feed here. We're doing this as a survival mechanism. Yeah. We feel terrible. And the term I don't hear much anymore. I mean, I don't know if it's being done. In, in the early stages of this, there was something called outplacement. We had big companies that did nothing more than help the employees find their next job. And a company that was laying off, of course, had to pay for this service. 
And yes, it was done maybe in the middle tier, the higher tier level of, of employee. I don't even hear about it much in the middle tier anymore. You know, supervisors, managers, those types of folks. So it's really a great benefit for them to have gotten uh, because, you know, I, I have a joke around here and people laugh at it. You know, people say that's a great resume. And I'll say, I don't always want the greatest looking resume. Sometimes I want a resume that looks awful. Why? Because that person is not a professional job seeker. That person <laughs> isn't firing up their resume every six months, paid a fortune for somebody to write it for them. You know, I, I want somebody who feels uncomfortable having to look for a job because they're used to keeping a job and holding a job. And, you know, you, you have to look at that in the context of why is this a bad resume? Is it because the person was sloppy and lazy or it's because the person didn't know how to write one? So those outplacement companies used to do that uh, for the people. And it showed caring from the employer's standpoint that it just wasn't ending here. You know, here's your, maybe if you're lucky, your severance package, have a nice life. They say, no, we also want to see you get a job, help you get a job, you know, the best of our ability. Uh, there's no caring at all in a lot of these companies. They've, they've had so many layoffs over the years that they're totally unsympathetic uh, to a large degree about the individual. You know, I'm sure they don't like to lay people off, but I think the desensitize, the feeling's just not there. It's what other companies do. It's what you have to do. And, you know, that leaves people in a bad spot, you know, because then they've, we talked about people feeling isolated and alone. Well, there's one of the reasons that they are, you know, they've just been cast aside and, uh, you know, maybe they're getting pressures at home from their family about making them feel guilty that now you're not going to bring home a paycheck. And, you know, I've got my own job and my own life to take care of, you know, you do your thing, sit at the computer terminal all day while you're home and send out resumes or whatever. And who are they going to talk to? Who are they going to, who are they going to emote to? And, the job board, uh, the Jobs and Careers Advice Forum, is designed for that. There are a lot of people in their boat or hopefully have been out of, in their boat and out of their boat that have a lot to offer them. And people need that. People need that. And, and, and that when you harm people in that way, in the way you treat them with a layoff or whatever, you're just programming a future generation to be that way or worse. Uh, you think about it. You know, you take somebody right out of college, they get their first job, they unfortunately pick a miserable company. They come there and their their eyes are bright and they're excited and boy, this is great. This is what I went to school with. And then the company doesn't play by the rules or the owner doesn't care really about their education. And all of a sudden the light starts to dim and you get another another person that unfortunately may not have that same level of motivation that they thought they were gonna have early on. Uh, that kind of our, uh, the excitement goes out. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. So let's, uh, yeah. how are you, so, so in a practical sense that yeah. from coming from the big picture and I, I'm with you on all this and I see okay. it, I feel it and it's so yeah. pretty because you can tell. And then also you can tell when people interview, they're carrying that baggage with them. Yeah. Let's say I'm interviewing with you, Mark, and you feel it on me. You'll take a pass because you're like, eh, this guy Jack feels a little, you know, he's a little resistant. Red flag, red flag. Red yeah, flag. I'll let me go, especially in this kind of market where there's so many people lucky. I'll, I'll yeah. go to the next one. What would you say as a, as a, you know, as a former outside recruiter, as a, in a current in in-house HR slash recruiter, what would you advise people? Because I guarantee you, you're absolutely right. And like, I would say it, the, to be conservative, 85 to 90 percent or 92 percent are have could completely understand what you're talking about and say, that's me, I get it. How do they switch it on? So I'm meeting with you, Mark, and I'm, I'm interviewing for a job and I'm carrying this. I've been, I've been out of work now for three, four, five, six months, seven months, eight months. You know, I get, I've been ghosted, I'm not getting feedback, but I got to put on that happy cherry face. Like, what, what would you say do they do to just, just help them get, you know, not blow it and, and, and best case do well? Well, I think a big piece of this is preparation. You know, they really have to take the time to figure out what they need to do to be successful in job seeking. You know, one of the problems I find with a lot of college students, I was one of them, you know, not until senior year, maybe never do they ever visit their career services on campus. Uh, don't know why that is, because it's probably the best bang they get for their buck mm -hmm. on campus. 
Uh, they've got the connections with the companies that recruit on campus. You know, they set up the career fairs. I mentioned we're doing a bunch of them here. Uh, they know the students and they recommend them to the representatives of the companies they've been working for a while, but they don't go there. That's number one. Number two, um, you know, it's got to be in some sort of a format, probably in video like YouTube or something along those lines. Certainly not opening up a book, which uh, we used to do. And I recommend that people start to do again. Matter of fact, here at this company, I've part of our learning and development, which I'm part of, I set up a, a call it a uh, voluntary book club. We take two books like Mindset and uh, we schedule a lunch hour and uh, we discuss it. The reason for that is that the average age of our employees is probably somewhere in the late 20s. I'm trying to get them to read again. I'm trying to get them to read the good stuff that's out there. I got a bookshelf. You can't see it behind me. All the latest bestsellers on career development and stuff like that because, I don't know, they came here. They tell me in the interview because that's my other part of the job. They want to advance. They want to learn. Well, we got Thurbo University at this company. We have a logo for it. It's got its own course catalog. We give them LinkedIn Learning. We give them Rockwell eLearning. We have TGIF Fridays. We bring in subject matter experts. And a lot of people don't even avail themselves of it. So I asked myself, I said, it's right here for you. Other companies don't even offer this stuff. You came, you told us that you really wanted to be better. You wanted to advance. Where's your end of the bargain? You got to take advantage and be appreciative that you have the opportunity that we're giving you to take advantage of this. So they have to read more. They have to talk to people more and network. They have to learn how you get a job. They have to learn how you decide on a career. They got to do the work. They got to do the research. They got to do the, have the conversations. They got to do the networking. And then I think they'll understand what not to say on that interview that you're talking about. You know, people tend to shoot themselves in the foot. You know, a few little words could get somebody in trouble. I, I had one before you and I spoke and I determined immediately that this guy was not going to buy into the fact that in our field, systems integration, it's basically automation. You're going to have to do 40 to 60% travel. That's just the way of this industry. And I can hear in the voice that he's not going to be too happy about that. And that's a red flag. You know, he, if he had researched the industry, he'd realize that that's a key component of what people in automation do. Figure it, our clients are big corporations with, you know, big chiller plants, et cetera. The work has to be done at those sites, not from the office that you're at, not from a home office. So you got to figure that you're going to have to spend some of your time on the road. And people don't do enough prep work. They have to really understand what it is that employers need to hear to make a favorable decision. Uh, but yet, and we do tell them to be themselves. I mean, that's one lesson we always, be yourself. Be yourself, but also be smart about it. You know, don't lie, but certainly don't set yourself up for failure. And, and I think that's what needs to be taught to people. And they have to be willing to accept it. How do you properly prepare yourself for an interview? How do you properly decide on a career field? Uh, and these are the kinds of posts we get on the board. You know, as, like we said earlier, some of these people are well advanced in their lives and careers. They haven't gotten it yet. I've noticed that as well, which is very surprising to me. And I've, I've seen it more uh, lately when, you know, we launched WeCurter with the idea of helping people during this pandemic to network, to, to be able to pitch themselves, to uh, just interact with other folks and get out there to get noticed, to get something to happen. And a lot of times it seems to me, and I don't wanna make it sound like I'm victim blaming. Right. Oftentimes it seems they don't wanna put in the time and effort. They just want someone to say, hey, Mark, I have a job for you. Here's a job. Here's what you do, go here and do this and you'll get the job. Instead of all the stuff you really need to do beforehand. It's very true. And I, I audience, by the way, not everybody falls into this category. There are plenty of, of you out there that you know, Jack and I are gonna take our hats off to and clap for because mm -hmm. you know, you're the successful people, maybe more successful than I mean, I'm I'm not successful. I'm successful in other ways, but you know, I'm, I'm certainly not a millionaire. I'm obviously not going to ever be one, but I'm happy in where I'm at. But if you want to get to where you're, you want to go, 
you got to put in that effort. You got to be prepared to do the work. And that involves, you know, spending time, not only working on the side, but learning things and maybe not just learning in school, but reading them. instead of a lousy TV show that you're watching, pick up a book, go on the bestsellers list, find out what books are out there that can help improve your professional skills. I mean, you're going to read a lot about soft skills right now is what companies are looking for. It's absolutely true. A company shouldn't have to train someone in everything that they should have learned in high school or college. That's ridiculous. I mean, we'll train people in the technical skills they need that they didn't get in school, but should we train people in how to get along well with others or how to write well? I mean, we're having to do that. A lot of companies are. This is, you've got to take responsibility. You've got to do this. This will make you a better candidate. This will make you a more successful employee. And you're in this for the long haul. You're going to see your boss and your coworkers more than you see your family. I mean, figure out the hours there. Some of the time you're home, you're sleeping. Other times you're zoning out with a book or if you read a book or watching TV or listening to music. The quality time, you're at work more than anything else. So if you want to love your family and provide for them, you have a responsibility to yourself to do whatever it takes to have that or to make that happen. And that involves preparation in everything. Preparation and looking for a job, preparation and finding the right career, which by the way comes first. And certainly preparation for everything you do once you get a job so that you do the job properly. I mean, you need to learn that job. You need to ask questions. You need to be able to. I love when somebody says, Mark, you know, I'm self-taught. I have a degree, but I learned all your stuff on my own by watching videos and by reading books and by talking to people in the field. That's true passion for what they want to do. You got to take the time. You got to have that passion and love it want to do it. And we always say, make it happen because nobody's going to make it happen for you. You got to do it yourself. And that's the problem we have with everything today. People want it delivered on a silver platter. It's, it's just not going to happen. Uh, people are too concerned about themselves to, in a lot of cases, to worry about where somebody else is. And that's where we're getting all this narcissism from. So we have to be narcissists for ourselves, not in a bad way, but looking out for ourselves. They say to a boss who opens a business, pay yourself first. Uh, and that's true. You got to pay yourself first. You're in a plane. Uh, all of a sudden, the plane is going down. Who puts the oxygen mask on first? You put it on the child? No, you put it on the mother. Why? Because she is the one responsible. She's got to make it happen for the family. So you got to work hard. You got to do other side jobs. You got to study, whatever, because you are responsible for yourself. And if you have loved ones, you're responsible for them, too, to a large degree. So that's the mindset I think we all need to adapt and things will turn out a lot better for everybody and we'll get to where we want to go and we'll be all better for it. Really good advice. It's just, in a way, it's you're espousing certain kind of like, I'll say tough love, if you will, in which you're saying, hey, it all starts if you, if you kind of from the top level saying, right, no one's going to hand you anything. It's a tough let's take this period of time we're in now. It's a really tough market. It doesn't look like it's going to change anytime quickly. Mm -hmm. And so you have to do whatever you know you need to do to succeed and move forward. And that means putting in a lot of time, a lot of effort. It's reading every, everything you can about interviewing, watching every YouTube video about interviewing. Absolutely. How do you can to find out what works, what doesn't work. If you go on LinkedIn, you want to network like crazy, Right, you want to kind of find everything because otherwise it's 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 hard to hard of impossible to make something happen. You know, I one of the last points I think because we're getting close uh, is yeah. people need to avoid self sabotaging themselves. I always remember a psychology course I took in college, and the professor made a very interesting observation that students would take a class on one side of the campus and then a class way on the other side of the campus, knowing that there wouldn't be enough time to get to the second class on time. And as a result, uh, they either might not go or they get there late and they'd be penalized for it. And, and they did that without realizing why, because they didn't want to accept the challenge and the responsibility. It was much easier when they failed the course to tell their parents, I just couldn't do it, or that professor was just too nasty. In other words, they didn't take responsibility. And they actually put barriers in front of themselves to set up a situation where they can fail and become a victim. 
And I think even in job search, that happens a lot. You know, hey, I sent out 150 resumes today online. Well, if you did any research, you'll know that those jobs you apply for online represent a very small percentage of the jobs that people actually get hired in. Oh, yeah, they fill it. But along the lines, I mean, we post jobs here at our company. And in the interim, an employee comes forward with somebody they know. So we pull the job and we hire that person. Uh, somebody has a relative, a vendor or whatever. We look at that person. Maybe we, because he's been referred or recommended or she, we go that route. So they don't realize, and it's true, that most of the jobs you get come from, it's that old phrase, kind of who you know. I mean, not knowing them well. You, you can get to know people that you didn't know before and get a job from them. Information interviewing, for example. You go on LinkedIn, you find somebody in your career field, and you reach out to them. And you have a conversation and say, listen, Mr. Employer, or John, or whatever you want to call them, I just got out of college. I'm looking for a job in the field. I see you've been doing a lot in the field. And I'm wondering if you just spare about 20 minutes either in the phone or I'll buy you a cup of coffee. I'd love to get some pointers from you. Fact of the matter is, what is that? Well, it's two people coming together, which is great. But more importantly, it's something that person asking for that meeting understands, but that other person granting it may not. That's an, a de facto interview. Two people get in the room. You have a career you want to talk about that you're getting into. That person can't help but notice what you're like, what you may know. And somewhere in their head, they're making a qualitative decision. I guarantee it. Is this somebody that we can use? Or I can't use them, but I have a good colleague that can. The job of that individual in the room, if that doesn't happen, might say, John, thank you so much for your time. This has been a great opportunity to sit with you. I hope to check back. I'd like to connect with you on LinkedIn. Let's stay in touch. Say, do you know anybody else that you think would be worthwhile for me to speak to? Uh, could you possibly either introduce me or, or let me know what their contact information is? You know, uh, the people, young people especially are very hesitant in doing this. It's, it's kind of the proverbial cold call that some people are afraid of. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You get somebody on the phone that says, nah, I don't have time for this. Great. You know what? A minute after that phone call, he won't even remember that you called. He won't know who you were or she. And then you go on to the next one. And it's a numbers game. Sooner or later, maybe within two or three calls, somebody's going to say, sure. People do it to me here all the time, and I meet with them. I invite them in. I give them a tour. It's goodwill. You know, they get to see our company. We, we give them some nice trinkets when they leave. And, and guess what? Now, maybe I don't have anything for that person now. They're on my radar. Maybe two or three years down the road, they get a good job. They get some experience. We're going to connect again. Uh, or I built a relationship with that person and a good friend of mine in recruiting says, Mark, I'm having a hard time finding X, Y, Z. Do you happen to know anybody? Yeah, I saw this great kid the other day who was in my office and I'd like to recommend him to you. You know, so people really have to be able to uh, protect themselves from self-sabotage and be a little bit more, not aggressive, but assertive in their approach in terms of finding a job. Those people that spent send out 100 resumes, you know what that is? That's busy work. That may not lead to anything. And they send 100 out more tomorrow. They feel great. I got 200 resumes out there. How many of those are even going to get a reply? I, I'd say less, less than a half a percent. And you could have been doing more if you wanted to by contacting and networking with people who can buy into what it is you need and, and satisfy that need rather than sending something blind off into the cyberspace and probably crossing your fingers that some of them may even reply. Um, I, I, think, I think that self-sabotage is something everybody really has to look closely at because I don't think a lot of people realize that they're doing it. Uh, they must avoid that like the plague and immediately put on a better face and forge ahead because as we always say, a job seek search is nothing different than a job. You need to put in eight hours a day Spend four hours in the morning, maybe networking and reaching out and try to spend your afternoons, the other four hours, or maybe even six or seven, actually talking to people physically or after the pandemic, I guess, anyway, or at least virtually. Uh, that's, that's time well spent on a job search. And, and that's somebody who dedicatedly, seriously 
through their gut, really wants to get a job or really wants to work because they're willing to do what it takes. Well, there's a lot there. <laughs> you know what? I love it because, you know, you're giving advice based on 45-ish years of experience as a business owner, as someone who ran a recruiting agency, someone who's a recruiter, someone who's an in-house HR recruiter, and, and other experiences as well, and a little psychology background too, undergraduate degree. I was also career services director, so I got to hear a lot of these stories. Yeah, so. and, and sometimes, you know, people need to hear that. They don't necessarily need to hear, you go, you can do it. And just that, just, you know, feel good stuff. But that's it's cheerleading, meaning. that's all it is. And what you, you've offered today, and I think for people watching it now and who will watch it, you know, when we upload it again and, and put it out on Twitter and Facebook and, and LinkedIn and such, is that, you know, this is valuable advice from a person who's been in, in, in this in the work world for a long time and seen a lot and, and displaced a lot of people, hired a lot of people, mentored a lot of people, and what works and what doesn't work. And it really boils down to really putting in the time, the effort, the sweat equity in your career. And, and, and everything you said as a business person myself now for, for, for 20 plus years, it resonates because you got to treat it like a business. Everything you say, that's what I do on a daily yeah, basis. True. Business owner, constantly working, constantly learning, constantly reading, you know, constantly talking to people to learn new things. And, and, it, and it helps and it works. And, and that's what you're having. You, you know, it's almost like, you're telling you know, the folks to treat yourself as the CEO of your own you know, career. And yeah. you, have to, you have to treat it like it's a business and you got to run it like it's your business and you're responsible for it and you got to make it happen. And you're that, that's it. You got to just make this work and do whatever it takes and put in the time, the energy, the effort to do it. And if you do, you can get the job. You can advance in your career. You can succeed. You can do well. And if you don't, ah, it's, it's not, it's not going to be easy. I'll tell you a quick one before we go. Yeah. Years ago, I mentioned that I was a town councilman, Freehold Borough, New Jersey, home of Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> and uh, you get assignments to different boards. The board in my town I got was public assistance. And I was working as a recruiter then for a big company, and we had a lot of job openings. And I went and I called all the public people on public assistance together and said, folks, no excuse. Any of you that want a job will have one. Well, I can't get back and forth to work. I said, well, I will arrange that we can get you back and forth to work. Some of you will drive with me. And, uh, you know, the newspapers wrote articles about that because, you know, I was able to offer them the jobs and they were able to work. Uh, surprisingly, some people did not take advantage of it that probably should have or could have. Uh, I think maybe they were self-sabotaging themselves. It was easier to collect that welfare check than it was to actually go and work. These were jobs, low barrier to entry. Uh, we were... Uh, they were packaging uh, prop items that were going back to IBM that needed to be refurbished. So anybody could do it. It paid decent. It was a lot better than being on the assistance rolls. You know, when the opportunity presents itself, you got to go grab it. And, uh, you know, I was giving people a great opportunity. There was no way to get out from under it. We get you there. You had a job. Uh, I think that's probably the best way to end today and say, look, look you know, opportunity may strike once you know, don't lose out on things that will get you to where you want to go. But even if they don't come to you, and most often they don't, you got to go out and get it, make it happen and do all the work. And uh, then you are, uh, you are, uh, you are worthy of getting, uh, getting the reward at the end. And you'll feel very good about it. I promise everybody, if you work hard at this job search thing, and you end up getting a job and you say to yourself, I did this, it's going to feel real good. So. That's a, that's a great way to end it. So thank you. I love that fatherly, grandfatherly, favorite Wait a minute here. Advice, <laughs> favorite uncle advice. That's you know, so you know, say telling the things that sometimes might not be comfortable for you to say, but you know you have to say it. You know, when you're a parent, and I'm a parent too. Sometimes you know you have to say these things. They don't want to hear, it, but you you know you know you have to say it because it's going to help them. It's for the best. And but helpful. I say that with a <laughs> smile. There you go. Excellent, Mark. Well, thank, thank you. So much. This was awesome. I think you really dispensed so much wisdom and so so much insight, and I think it's going to help a lot of folks. So thanks. Well, good luck, everybody, and thank you very much, Excellent. Jack. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mark. Take care. Hope you enjoyed this episode of the WeCruiter podcast. If you want to check out other great content from WeCruiter, make sure to visit us at WeCruiter.io. That's W-E-C-R-U-I-C-R dot I-O. 
We offer tons of great resources for job seekers and professionals, so make sure to check us out today.